Hello. Dr. John McKay. Yes, how are you? How are you? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Very well. Well, thank you for joining us from Bogota. How, um, how is the conference over there? I know you went there for, is it MJ BizCon South America? Um, it was uh, MJ BizCon Latin America. Latin America, um, okay. So, yeah. So they had the two days of of the conference. The first day was going through a lot of the different opportunities and what to watch for as you move into the cannabis um, application or business. And so they had a lot of very good speakers, both from the United States and from uh, the different countries here in South America. Nice. They had, um, I think they probably registered maybe 400 people, but another probably 150 people uh, signed up on site. So it was well done just on the fact of having the translation there. So you could just, you know, put the earphones on and, and be able to hear um, Spanish um, speakers in real time English and the reciprocal where American speakers or English speakers um, was translated into, into Spanish. Nice. So it was a great representation. I think they said 20 countries finally uh, were um, participating. So that was quite good. Awesome. So what what do you think is going to happen as far as the status of cannabis evolving in Latin America? They're moving towards a lot of the um, practices, uh, best practices that have been displayed in, in other countries. So, for example, Canada has done a nice job on um, um, some of the legislation and some of the things to uh, think about. They're also, because they export so many other problem, uh, the problems, other products to the rest of the world that they're very familiar with the guidelines as far as uh, you know selling a botanical product to other countries and what has to be done for good manufacturing practices and who has to be able to um, look at their sites and judge their sites um, for compliance. So um, when you look at coffee, or you look at sugar cane, or you look at any of the other products that, that come out, um, for example, uh, cut flowers and such, that they're very used to those types of regulations and right. around the world. Right. Which country do you think is going to be the forerunner in Latin America as far as growing cannabis and taking on the technologies? So having grown up in Vermont and being... Um, educated in the American schools, geography has not always been my strongest <laughs> suit. Um, however, when I was in fifth grade, we did study South America quite a bit. Right. But during that time, we did not, um, we did not discuss uh, cannabis or where we thought it was going to be. But when I look at what they had presented today, um, I think each country has its uh, capabilities and each country has its, its growing characteristics and what it should do. Um, in the cannabis industry, I think that the popular opinion was that Colombia has such a large land base that the hemp product can be grown on that they perhaps could be the, the largest producer of that. But it's my first foray into South America. So I'm mostly just uh, giving my opinion based on what I'd heard at the presentations. Fabulous. Now, as far as the import regulations, at what point do you think, I mean, at this point, can they? export hemp into the United States, or is that highly regulated as well? I believe that's highly regulated. Okay. Um, based on what I'd seen from some of the presentations was as they're moving forward, they're trying to understand how to go through those legal hoops. I also think that uh, the United States um, allows crops to cross into the United States as long as they're really uh, hemp seed or some of the other products that are that are viable. I don't think that there's a um, any regulation as far as the oil, but I also don't know that the border guards are going to, you know, accept everything that comes across the border either. So I I don't know where that was going, especially towards the U.S. There was a lot of uh, talk about what the litigation would have to be and the different treaties and and other things between the countries. 
Okay, cool. Um, do you, what do you think needs to happen in order to, in order to uh, be able to export and maybe have a change in regulation? I think on the United States side, it's not going to happen until it's completely federally legal on, on the hemp side. Or the, the other part is, can they classify different parts of the hemp plant so that hempcrete or material that might be crossed across the border to make hempcrete were separated from hemp seed, which is also a viable product um, as a protein. You can buy it anywhere. It's just hemp seed. It's a very uh, protein rich product. And so I think that um, until there's until there's full regulation, I think that you're going to be a more of a segmentation. Okay. Awesome. Well, Dr. McKay, thank you for all that additional information. Of course, this was a uh, Nice and extra, so thank you for reporting uh, in real time from Bogota. Appreciate it. Um, of course, we didn't get a chance to do a full introduction and talk about your background in cannabis. Can you tell us a little bit about how you actually became involved in the sector, what your experiences are, and uh, what you've learned so far, I guess, being in industry? My first experiences into the cannabis industry were in 2013. Um, and during that time, it first became part of my um, understanding the technology based on living in Massachusetts and working for uh, Waters Corporation. And within that realm, I was responsible for some of the marketing programs across the Americas. And during that time, that's when people started to look into um, the um, the legalization in the state of Colorado and the state of Washington. And during that time, one of the things that, that came up was the analytical testing of, of the product, the potency. So I was involved early on with some of the regulatory um, labs that were coming into place, like CAN labs out of Denver. And there were several out of <laughs> Washington that were starting to, to uh, build up the laboratories to be able to test the potency and some of the other tests that were just coming into line. There wasn't even tests for pe pesticides back then in 2013-2014. From that um, time, it, I became more uh, interested in the extraction side of the, of the business um, because it, there was a, a limited number of companies that were involved and some of the equipment wasn't as uh, as sophisticated as could be done during that segment. So as I looked at that um, back then, extractions were taking you know 18 hours. They were done well under 2000 PSI by CO2. And um, the products that we were able to bring forth into the, into the industry were going up to 8,700 PSI and a higher flow rate. And so that gave a, an advantage to being able to move the extraction technology from you know 12 to 18 hours at best down to 90 minutes. And then from there, just in continuing to expand how the extraction could be done, starting to segment the, uh, the waxes away from the cannabinoids, being able to uh, introduce co-solvents. So there were a lot of things that were pretty open territory between 2013 and say 2016. Awesome. So uh -huh. you're covering a whole lot of ground. So it sounds like the higher the PSI, the quicker the extraction. Is that accurate? So the higher the PSI with CO2, the more polar the compound is. So you will pull a lot more compounds out. So something maybe about 6,500 PSI would be fairly equivalent to, to ethanol, for example. Mm -hmm. And when did you guys start experimenting with the different solvents. Was CO2 one of the first solvents that you were using in terms of extraction? Yeah. So back in that time, there was very little ethanol, actually. And there was some of the uh, hydrocarbons, the gaseous hydrocarbons, and some of the liquid hydrocarbons like hexane. And so there was a limited number of solvents because there was also a limited number of states that were doing anything and a limited number of the amount of crop that could be done. So back then, in 2014 or so, it was still something that would be as small as a five liter vessel would have been more than enough uh, extraction capability for a company. And so from that time, the state started to grow, people started to grow more material, there were more licenses given out, and therefore the product started to expand as far as uh, the size, and number, 
and the number of people that were getting into the business. Okay. So I guess a more fundamental question, why extraction even? Why not people just, you know, buy the flour, smoke the flour, the good old hash brownies of the yesteryear? Why foray into these complex chemical, uh, I guess, processes? I think it's sort of, uh, I'm going to say similar to the natural products industry, as well as uh, when you start to look at um, the pharmaceutical side of the business. So in pharmaceutical, usually a, 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 a first a rendition of a, of a medicine might be a tablet, and then it might be a long-lasting tablet, and then it might be a capsule, and then it might be a suppository, and then it might be um, different liquids for, for children. And so I think what's happened is a natural expansion of the of the customer wanting a different formulation that they would be able to either um, just more discreetly um, ingest or something that is more amenable to their um, their preferred route. So um, people you, you start to look at the vitamins when vitamins first came out as gummy bears. It was, in my mind, a little bit horrific, but I, I do know that. It, it, it was easier for children to take a gummy bear. You just want to make sure that they didn't think it was really a candy. Um, the same thing happens with the cannabis, that if you're having you know, the age group of people who were not wanting to bring smoke into their lungs for whatever reason, then they were more amenable to having a, an edible, for example, a chocolate or a gummy bear or a tincture into their tongue where it was more acceptable and more discreet for them. So I think the formulation um, have, have expanded the way everything else is expanded with more adaptables to what a person is used to taking or what they're more familiar or more comfortable. Okay, so it's basically to accommodate consumer preferences and potentially to provide a specific uh, medicinal benefit to the consumer. Is that a pretty fair assumption? Yeah, I think my 30-second 30 my 30 uh, or a minute explanation was better done by your, <laughs> your five-second <laughs> review. <laughs> Highly dotted. So when you're doing extraction, what are the things that you're trying to get out of the cannabis plants? Is it only cannabinoids or are there other compounds that are beneficial? So a good question. And I'm asked it a lot. And the second one that I'm also asked as a follow-up on that one is what's the best extraction? And today at the seminar, People were asking about the future of extraction. And I, I say the future of extraction is you start out with the formulation that you're going to make. Is it a tincture? Is it a gummy bear? Is it a uh, smokable? Uh, uh, thought, is it, a, is it a, um, a suppository? Each one of those is going to have a different characteristics and ingredients that it's going to need to have in it. And then you back up from that to what are the ingredients that I need to have in that product and ingredients I don't want to have in that product. And then you back up to there to how can I get those ingredients out of a plant? The cannabis plant has uh, several, it has more than several, has 500 different compounds in it. And so when you look at that, it's, it's getting the compounds that you want into a certain ingredient. So the the art form of extraction is to is to best. So B should stand for botanical integrity, making sure that what you want out of the plant you're getting. So some people are going to want to have the terpenes. They're going to have the different flavonoids along with the with the cannabinoids themselves. The second one is efficient extraction. So you're going to want to have the extraction that's full of efficacy. So you want to make sure you're not introducing something into a product that, that you're not wanting to have in its final ingredient. And then S is for safety and safety from the instrumentation and from the people, you know, gathering the crop. So there's good agricultural practices. You know, do you have the right clothing on? Um, everything is more on the safety side, even with OSHA. And then the other one you have is T is for, for testing with, with um, modern equipment. So when you're looking at the number of people that are trying to get products out of the cannabis plant, they've become more and more uh, variable and they're wanting more that they can have so that they can, in the final formulation, limit the ones that they want to have in there. Okay. So we hear a lot about the entourage effect and we hear about terpenes. What do they mean? Is it important to have the entourage effect? 
What are your thoughts? So for me, um, on the thought side, there's enough scientific data with metadata as well as more um, work that's been done in clinical trials that have demonstrated that a pure compound, no matter what it is, doesn't have the same effect on bioavailability and bioactivity as the number of com- as other compounds that would be joined in there. What the research hasn't showed and continues not to show, and that was which ones are there. So if you can't figure out which ones are really the, the major contributors or helping with the entourage effect, then you get as many in there that aren't going to do any harm to you at the same time could provide the uh, capability for for having a greater bioactivity. Um, I was at the CanMed conference last week in Pasadena, California, and that's where a lot of the medical doctors were demonstrating some of the work they've done, as, as well as Dr. Mishulam going back through and showing some of his new compounds that he had had. had. And on those, every single study showed that it wasn't a single compound that was more effective than having uh, multiple compounds, which would be the entourage effect. So it's beneficial to have a group of cannabinoids in concert with terpenes to have a more medicinal effect. Is that an accurate summation? So the only thing I would say on that one is is the terpenes are only one of the other flavonoids and alkaloids and other compounds that could be contributing to the uh, synergistic effect and making the receptor sites more open to to the uh, cannabinoids themselves. So it could be a combination of other things just besides the, uh, the terpenes. So terpenes on the other side, even though they may not have an effect on that receptor, they might have effect on other receptors that now you have this co, you know, co experience where the cannabinoids may be doing something for the anti inflammatory or for seizures. And meanwhile, limonene or alpha beta pinene are giving you a, a different um, experience where you're more, you know, more lightened, you're more um, aware because the terpenes on their own have their own effect. So you could have not only an entourage effect of of the effect of the the cannabinoids on the uh, CB1 and CB2 sites, but you may be having co-experiences with the the other terpenes or other compounds and other receptors. Interesting. So there are a variety of ways where cannabinoids in concert with other flavonoids in the plant can provide medicinal effects. Yes, and I think that's proven out by the enormous amount of work that's been done on aromatherapy. Um, where you're just looking at a number of different compounds that, that do provide an experience and the body also has some healing effect um, from those. Interesting. Now, if anyone uses vape, there are all these fancy names for a variety of different vapes that are out in the market, gelato, Maui, Wai, you, you name it. Um, how are they constituting those products? Oh, that's something you probably have to look at each individual company. I think each... I think the answer to that is the number of companies and then multiply times three. And each company is probably doing it three different ways, no matter what it is. So just take the number of companies and multiply times three. And, and they're all doing it differently. Um, I would guess that there's few that are doing it the exact same way. So everyone believes that their way is the best or they wouldn't be in the marketplace. Right. So it, it, it's it's. It, it does multiply as much as the number of coffee shops that you have. I would say the coffee shops is another analogy of, you know, which coffee are they are they holding and how are they making it and stuff. So I think the the vape pen itself is um is not a simple answer. Every single one of them is doing it differently. So how are they getting the standardization the standardization in a lot of these formulations? Obviously, you know, two vapes that are named the same exact name with the same company have the same exact constituents. So how are they getting this consistency? Obviously, the plant doesn't provide the same exact level of cannabinoids and terpenes in each batch. So now you've moved out of the the world of science into the world of marketing. Mm. And so the world of marketing is if they can use whatever name they want. And so they're using a name, companies will use a name that uh, they believe will 
perk the customer's eyes and therefore encourage them to invest in the product. So, you know, it, it will be the same exact, um, the same problem. It really, it really does move out of the science into the, into the marketing. So there's no way to do the standardization. If someone wants to call it something, you know, hokey pokey yellow, then, and hokey pokey yellow seems to be matching what people want. Then someone else will name it hokey pokey yellow, which I, I I'm guessing I shouldn't trademark. <laughs> I don't know if that will be very popular, but let's say if we have hokey pokey yellow <laughs> and, um, you know, we have a first batch of marijuana plants that we process into this hokey pokey yellow, but the second batch, let's say, may have less cannabinoids or less terpenes. How do we make sure that the consumer has a consistent experience? That goes, that really does go to the marketing. So on that side, there's, there, a company should be responsible for their own product having that. So when they go back to it, it's, um, it's the same thing as, as cooking or any other product, but we'll stick with cooking. So if I have a, a way of I'm making the same yellow cake and I have so many eggs, I mean, so many flowers, I have so much of all the other components. Um, I like to use analogies. So if you do that and you add all the components together and then you say to yourself, oh, I didn't turn on the oven. And so now you have to wait another 15 minutes for it to go to 350 degrees. Meanwhile, the cake batter that you had already put together is now already starting to brew. And so you're going to start to see bubbles on the top of the cake. So even though you have the same ingredients and you believe you had the same SOP, you didn't immediately put the cake into the oven at the same time. So now you have two yellow cakes, one that's very smooth and, and, uh, and uh, moist, and the other one has holes on it because it's already started to to work through the gaseous phase. And the same thing can happen with hokey pokey yellow. That if I mix up the, the timing or I mix up um, uh, the temperature or the size of the vessel, then each one of those can, can Im be impacted to the final product. But let's say the first batch of the hokey pokey yellows had 15% in cannabinoids and a variety of terpenes that were completely different than the second batch. Let's say the second batch had 12% in cannabinoids and completely different terpene profile. Is there any way to fix that in order to make sure that the final product feels and provides a similar experience to the consumer? Oh, so I, I, I appreciate the clarification and the softball coming at me so slowly to, to answer the question. So the best thing I would do is I would have analytics in between. I would make sure that internally I have a way of knowing at each step along the way what that percentage is so that by the time I get to that end product, it's not a surprise. I actually know that I've measured the potency of the ingredients. I have measured the integrity of the ingredients and what they have in it. So that I always know that it has 12% before I put it into the vape pen, but I also knew that it had 12% when it came out of distillation. I knew that I'd done a, a, a terpenoid ratio so that I know that I'm within plus or minus 5% of what I said the terpenes would be in. So the terpenes with limonene or linalool, you've already done that upfront testing so that you know that you're within the guidelines of what your own SAP is, SAP, SOP. So even in the pharmaceutical industry, they're allowed to have a certain percentage of plus or minus one or whatever is allowable through the for the government. The same thing would happen with internal testing to make sure that all steps along the way, that by the time you got to the final product, you had everything in there at the ratio and amount that you said you were going to. And is that the job of the synthetic chemist to make sure that these products are pretty consistent? Yeah. So you have quality control chemists and you have quality assurance chemists. So you know, testing the products as they come in to make sure that they're 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 what you expect them to be based on what someone had given you as a COA, trust nobody. And then as you move through the process, doing the different testing along the way so that when you finally go to the quality control at the end, you, you have got what you expected to have. And so there's no surprises. Is it fair to say that the products that customers obtain from dispensaries have gone through all these levels of testing? I would suspect that a dispensary has done their homework to make sure that they've done due diligence on the products that are sitting on their shelves to make sure that that they have 
met the criteria of what their what their um, business is doing. So a lot of times I'll see some of the dispensaries go back through and they'll they will test and retest and they'll take small amounts of product to make sure that the quality control is the same. And so some of the major dispensaries certainly will go through that due diligence. And I would I would hope that most dispensaries are doing that. Now, there seems to be a lot of conversation about a vape-related problem um, in the nation where a, a lot of patients that are taking or actually recreational users that are taking vapes are coming down with a certain lung disease. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And is it related to where the patients are obtaining the product? So I would um, go to my um, background of what I've read as well as, you know, some of the studies I've seen um, through the different regulatory agencies as well as the CDC and people trying to get to the bottom of this. Um, based on what I've read, um, the single most important culprit during these uh, was vitamin E acetate. And so vitamin E acetate is a, is a typical pro, uh, product that's used in food or used to make sure for make sure oxidation doesn't happen, but it, but it was never met and nor is it on the, you know, grass um, for, for being able to be inhaled. And so the process that happens when we as humans breathe, we breathe through a, through our lungs and in our lungs, we have alveoli and on the, on, on the layer of the alveoli is a, is other substances that allows the oxygen to pass from the lung into our bloodstream and then carried off so that we can um, live. And what happens with some of the work that I've seen with the vitamin E acetate is it disrupts that interface and therefore the oxygen cannot get from the lung into the body. There is some other work that's been done along the way um, or historical work, and that was, I believe, down in, I'm going to say Texas, and it had to do with the liquid, um, with the pre-processing for buttery popcorn. And uh, in that case, that's where popcorn lung came from, because people working in the factory were breathing in, but not realizing that they were also breathing in very small particles of oil. And so it coated the lungs, and, and, and tragically, uh, a number of people died. And then they went back through to find out about that. So this is something similar where people have added a, 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 a product into something that wasn't meant to be inhaled. I had also talked with other people. Um, so I'll do anecdotal versus typical peer reviewed. And that was when you're looking at a vape pen that was made outside of the regulatory market and you were wanting to see how good that THC potency was is that you could take a vape pen and you could you know put it in a vertical position and then flip it 180 degrees and then you would see how fast the bubble moved through and the slower the bubble moved through was anecdotally would be how you would how good you thought that oil was mm. and so some people would add vitamin e acetate to as a thickening so that it would you would perceive that the bubble was moving as slowly as a high THC oil might be, even though it wasn't. Is that the same thing as honey cut? Is what? Honey cut? Heard that I name not know. Okay. I've heard um, that name used particularly in the black market as a thickening agent. So. Okay. Let's see. Um, as far as extraction, obviously, it, do you have a preferred method of extraction? And does it really make a difference what solvent is used? So the quick answer is I have no preferred um, go-to extraction uh, method because I, I really do go back to the formulation and wanted to know what ingredients are needed and what the final formulation was going to be. So if you have room temperature ethanol, you're going to get a lot of compounds. And if you have cold ethanol at minus 40 or minus 60 or minus 80 degrees, you're going to have less compounds. And so on my side, I look at it for speed, selectivity, and scalability. And so when you're looking at each one of those, you're trying to figure out um, which one is most important. But you only get two. You can't have all three of speed, scalability, and selectivity. Hmm. So I, I bring it away from the cannabis 
to bring it to another analogy that's closer to people that help them understand what the cannabis is doing. You wake up in the morning and you want to have coffee. And a lot of people say they have coffee because they want to be awake. Well, that's just caffeine. That's the major part is caffeine. So if you just wanted caffeine, then you would just take no dose or take a, a, a caffeine pill. But a lot of people like the experience of the coffee. So when I wake up in the morning and I want to have coffee, the best way to get caffeine and all the other flavors out of a coffee bean is methanol, acetonitrile, or acetone, hexane. There's a lot of different ways to do that. But I didn't choose any of those solvents because my final formulation I was going to put into my body. And those are all poisons to my right. body. Yeah. And it won't so taste that great water. either. <laughs> no, and I don't want to taste that. So if you use <laughs> ethanol, you're awake, but you don't know exa exactly where you are by 8 a.m. <laughs> so what you want to do on the preferred side is there's also a difference between cold brew coffee and hot brew coffee. And the cold brew coffee has about a thousand compounds that come out, but not the bitter acids. But remembering cold brew coffee takes you 10 hours to make. And if you want coffee in the morning and you start the cold brew coffee at 7 a.m., you know, you've got to wait till 5 p.m. to get that first cup of coffee. That may not meet your criteria for what you were trying to hope for. For speed, yeah. But if you want to do cold brew coffee because you liked it, then you would make it the night before and just and just let it sit the 10 hours and you start it at 8, 8 p.m. so that it would be ready at, at 7 a.m. Did I do the math right? Well, close enough. And so if I go back through, it's, it's a matter of what you want to have it and then going back through so that you know um, that it's prepared for when you need it and the ingredients you have. Hot brew coffee has over 1,500 components. And when you look in the different stores and they tell you, when they made it, the reason they're telling you when they made it is because as it sits there and it has all those acids and such, it's now oxidizing and it's making it worse and worse flavor as it's sitting there. That makes sense. So when you do cold brew coffee, it's not going to change. You put it in the fridge and you can have it a week later and it's the same. Why is that? Because it didn't have the acids. Interesting. Okay. Is water extraction possible with a cannabis plant? It's called water hash. So yes, the quick answer is yes. The longer answer is you can also do that with water and then having a high shearing force so that you have, you're using the water as a media. So if you were to have something where you had the cannabis plant in there and you had a, a motor that was spinning around fast enough to cut up the, the plant material, it's also going to open up all the trichomes and all the material is going to fall out like opening up an egg. And then from there, it's a matter of separating the oil from the water because the cannabinoids aren't water soluble. And so now you would typically go through centrifuges or some other way to reduce the water. And so you can do it by water, certainly. Um, remembering that uh, ice hash is water still because it's frozen water. It's a solid water, but it's still water. And what is rosin? Or Rosa? So, uh, <laughs> either, either way. So there's a lot of different ways of making it. Again, another solventless way of doing it. So whether people are making rosin through uh, pressure or they're making it through other means, it's, it's, it is more of something that you're actually squeezing the plant more and therefore it, you're popping open the, the trichomes and therefore the contents are, are spilling out. So it's uh, I, I've totally lost an analogy other than the fact that taking an iron and pressing it down, it will squeeze everything out and so uh, rosin is more towards towards that side of the equation so it's a good it's a good product there's other ways of making rosin there's probably a lot of ways but the most common way is is just making sure you have the oil much like you would have rosin for your um for the batters of the pitchers or for your string instrument there's a lot of things that that move into the rosin world Essentially, it's like a cold press olive oil, right? It's completely mechanically pressed and you're getting all the good stuff without any solvent. You're doing it solventless. That's solventless. Correct. Okay. Remembering that the that the plant probably has some moisture in it, so you get a little bit of water. But yes. Okay. Now, um, obviously, a variety of solvents are used: COT versus hexane. Is there any residual solvent left? Because I know a lot of people do prefer the CO two extraction, but is there a specific reason for it? The specific, the difference between hexane and CO two isn't that isn't that much. They're very close in, in polarity. They're both nonpolar. 
Um, hexane has, it's called a hydrocarbon for a reason. It only has carbon and hydrogen. And CO2 has carbon and two oxygens. And so the reason that it's more or less nonpolar is that the oxygens are, are 180 degrees away from each other, about 180 degrees away from each other in the carbon. So it, it acts like it's nonpolar, even though it has oxygen on it. The nice part about CO2 is as you add pressure and the comp and the molecules come closer and closer together, it becomes a supercritical fluid and an unfortunate name, but that's the name of it. Some people used to call it dense CO2. And so when you do that, it now, as you gain more pressure, it, it becomes more and more polar and it becomes more and more soluble. The reason people like to use CO2 is because it can get into the plant cell much more easily and it moves freely about. So it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a gas and a liquid. And so it acts like a gas sometimes, it acts like a liquid sometimes. And so that's the, the power of CO2. With CO2, you hypothetically shouldn't get any solvent. But one of the things that you still have to think about is there's the plant still has some solvent. So if you have 5% moisture, then, then you have 5% water in there. The plant also on its own right is a living plant. So depending on how old the plant is, the plant still could have acetone in it because it's a, it's a living plant. There still could be some acetone. So there's other things that could be coming as a contribution to the CO2 that the plant brings with it versus the CO2. Hexane is going to be the same way. Hexane is going to pick up anything that's that's a, a nonpolar, like dissolves like. And so it might drag stuff out of a out of a inside of a tube, or they might drag some out. So either one of those, the, the key is looking for the residual solvent, whether it's hexane or, or the other solvents. And so the biggest part is boiling off anything that it could be or evaporating them off. So both are fine. But CO2 does have that reputation, if done correctly with the right plant, that it shouldn't have any solvent residual. It should go back into the atmosphere. And with hexane, if it's done correctly, is there any residual solvent left in the final product? No. And is that something that is tested for? Yes. Okay. So basically, if you're getting a tested product, you're getting a clean product. That's pretty much the moral of the story. It is the moral story. No matter what solvent you use, whether it's 134A, which is tetrafluoroethane, ethanol, a mixture of ethanol and water, it doesn't matter what the acetone, it doesn't matter what they are. The basic part is to be able to move and, and had the residual solvent gone. Some of the things that make it, that you can start to make a choice is, is if you're having ethanol and you're wanting all the ethanol to be gone and you're having to heat it and you don't have it under pressure, then, then any of the volatiles are also going to be gone. So you're getting rid of the ethanol, but you, you also have to get rid of, of all the other compounds. Okay. Well, I think that was a very good analysis of how extraction is done. Is there anything you wanted to add? I think that the biggest um, opportunity in today's cannabis world is the continuing um, education of the investors, of the consumers, and the continuing advance of science outside of you know bias. And I think that I'm seeing more of these different conventions that the investors are are realizing that that they're not taking anybody's advice on their own, they realize that that they have to they have to do their own due diligence. They have to be responsible humans. I think the other part too is that people's ideas of being uh, billionaires and everyone's going to be a, a millionaire based on this has also been more tempered by by the more current uh, round of investors. So if I was to say anything that would be additional and that was we seem to be in like the fourth phase of this of this natural product. I think the other part of this is that people are now understanding that this is not the only natural product on the planet. Um, and so they're moving more towards what other products can have things, which has been very well known for pharmacognosy and um, ethnobotany for a long time. So I think that I think the market's. Moving closer, I don't know that that um, 
that uh, the federal government in the United States is going to quickly move towards legalization without some regulation. And I think that uh, I think that more and more of the young scientists are moving out of their traditional pharmaceutical roles and moving into the into the cannabis roles because they understand the pluses and minuses of the pharmaceutical products that they were making or selling or providing support for. And then realizing that there's other things that can be done also. And it's, like, it, it, it's, it's encouraging their curiosity and their involvement in uh, pharmacognosy again. Fabulous. And I think programs like this one are, are also good because now it's something that people can listen to and and they can, whether it's interesting or not interesting, at least it can be controversial. Hopefully interesting. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Colombia. Uh, enjoy the rest of your conference and we'll speak soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night.